Hello, everybody, and a very warm welcome to the Property Investor Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Lanfear. As you know, my inner lawyer has to say, nothing in the podcast is health, legal, or uh, a financial advice. Do your own due diligence. You know that. It's a great pleasure. I welcome back to the podcast, Adam Lawrence. Adam, how are you, my friend? I'm very well, Paul. Thanks. Thanks for having me again. It's uh, it's a pleasure. I'm really excited to get into this. Um, so, what can we say about Adam? Adam has done over 500 property transactions, which is an eye-watering and slightly terrifying amount, if I'm completely honest. Um, he's a, a genuinely experienced practitioner in all things property and business. I had the great pleasure of spending a, a day with him not so long ago and got huge, huge value and um, I would highly recommend that to you. He's done a lot of joint venture work. He recently did um, a podcast with um, Rod, the Rodcast on that. Please go and have a look at that. Adam, as I say, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Now, a lot of people who follow this podcast also follow your supplement, which you release on a Sunday. And so you are a kind of by, on, like by request annual guest now because people really enjoy your supplement. So I thought we'd head along um, along those lines. So we're still in quarter one. I know the year is like flying by. But give you give us your download on 2023. What were the lessons that you learned as an investor? What was the lessons that the listeners and watchers of the podcast perhaps could have learned? I think that we we learned a few things, Paul, really. And reflecting, is, I think it's a good place to start because reflecting is always good. Um, mm -hmm. we, we remembered that even though, really, if we're involved in property, we're, we're taking... We're putting in a lot of effort normally. People who are listening to this podcast, you and I included, we put in a lot of effort. I don't think we take an awful lot of risk. And I think that's the benefit side. And we we achieve reasonable to very good to extraordinary returns sometimes. So that's the, the framing. But remember, we still do take a bit of risk. And one of the risks is that prices don't go up over time. And if you just look at nominal prices, like the whole of the world is obsessed with, you know, things decayed maybe a little bit last year, depending on which one of the indices you want to listen to. Mm -hmm. But whichever one you listen to, we didn't keep pace with inflation. So that that was that was where we we're at. It's a possibility to have a year like that. It is only one year. It's a reminder that properties for life, not just for Christmas. Um, it was a tough year, I think, for people to do deals still because we had a 2022 mindset in a lot of vendors and a 2023 reality and a much higher interest rate. So ultimately, there was an uncomfortable period. I know that I was certainly feeling uncomfortable around June, July sort of time, because there didn't seem to be a necessary top or a lid to where the interest rate might go. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily even the number, even though the number has been fairly uncomfortable for people, it's the trend and it's the feeling of, well, you know, I mean, even one of my business partners, I respect his opinion an awful lot, was saying to me at one point, I think base is going to go 7% here. And I thought, well, of course, today, even today, that's still possible if there was a massive uptick in inflation again. That is still possible, but it's much less likely. Now, I didn't think we were going to go to seven, but there were certainly points last year where I thought six or six and a half could be could be very feasible. Mm -hmm. And obviously, we don't feel like that today. So that's a lot more comfortable. And also, as those who do listen to the supplement regularly, I talk about the bond yields an awful lot. It's the bond yields that are down, you know, 1% off their peaks from last year, which is where the mortgage monies are set from. And the lenders are the same as we are as investors, really. When the trend is upwards and they don't know where it's going to stop, mm -hmm. they're scared to put competitive products out. They don't want to you know, remember, these people have to organise 100 million, 250 million plus worth of finance mm -hmm. and then be happy to pump it out at that price. Mm -hmm. And they saw demand collapsing for loans just because of the pricing mm -hmm. and the uncertainty. So then they introduce more margin because there's more risk. And we don't need more margin at a time like this. We need lower margin. And that's where we are. If you talk to the lenders today, that's where we are. Their margins are lower than they've been over previous years. But they're in the market. They're keen to do business. They want to keep the train on the tracks. And at the very start of 2024, all the reports from the agents that we speak to are positive. Um, the numbers look better than early 2023. But to put that into context, early 23, you know, Jeremy Hunt and Rishi were still sweeping up after uh, our, our mutual friend 
Ms Truss and her erstwhile Chancellor, Mr Kamikwazi Kwarteng. So obviously it should be better than 12 months ago. But the, the overall look, feeling is important in the economy, in the wider economy, in people, in property buyers, in the retail buyers who keep the market moving and set the prices by which we get our valuations, really. And there's positivity. There seems to be the most evenly balanced market as, as a rule. Obviously, it varies nationwide. It, it always does. But it seems to be the most evenly balanced market since 2019, early 2019 to me. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I like those conditions. We did well in 2019. Um, they're good trading conditions. I think that there's still lots of people who aren't on the bus that I'm on at the moment, which is very positive. I think I've never been as bullish on property prices. And most of that is driven by my views on inflation and how much in real terms, you know, we're down 15% from the real terms peak, mm -hmm. Paul, um, because inflation has been so high. That's not necessarily directly related to the property market itself. But we do know when people are getting paid more money and we've got some big wage rises in the pipeline this year, you know, and some big benefits rises and all the rest of it. Um, that's going to put money in people's pockets. And it's the UK. People like to buy houses, ultimately. So mm -hmm. it was the first time buyers that were still active in 2023 and actually formed the biggest part of the market. But of course, the transaction numbers were down, you know, a couple of hundred thousand transactions. So the number of FTB transactions was still down a bit. But the the percentage that were first time buyer was actually quite a bit. It was the highest percentage of first time buyer activity for many many years, actually, because they're the most motivated people in the marketplace. But the people who've been shackled into an existing mortgage or don't know if they can port it or whatever, whatever, you know, you become more flexible as your mortgage rate drops off, don't you? Because mm -hmm. if you're on a variable rate, the current variable rate average from the big banks is still seven point nine eight percent. Yeah. Um, and we all know that you can go and get something. If you're if you're in a great position in Resi, you can still go and get a 4% mortgage at the mm -hmm. moment. Well, that would that would obviously halve that bill. And so it goes from real lack of motivation for the second steppers to move. But as soon as the mortgage rate expires, suddenly you've got massive motivation to either refinance or move. Mm -hmm. And so the lid starts to lift. So it's building this picture of what this interest rate rise has done over the past couple of years and then understanding the impact of that, I suppose. I've wrapped a lot of concepts into one answer there. No, so you have. But, I, no, no, but that's really, really helpful. And I mean, just anecdotally, I mean, I got a, a, a message from a really good non-property friend just you know, talking exactly about what you talked about. They popped out onto their variable rate. They're not in property, so you wouldn't anticipate there would be forward planning and perhaps the way that we do. Um, and they're exactly in that situation. They would look at a doubling of their interest rate. Um, and the answer was nice and straightforward. Go and speak to this broker. Just look at the whole market. You'll be surprised what you get. And actually, they, uh, I don't know the detail of it, but my, my sense is they probably ended up on a great rate and, and are off to the races again. And they've got very little to worry about. But as you say, it's about their position. I suspect they were in a pretty good position. Well, we benchmark things, don't we, as people? So if they were on 2%, and then they went to 8%, and now they're looking at going back to 4%. 4% yeah. looks cheap, whereas when you're on 2 and you need to go to 4 it yeah. looks dead expensive. So there, there is that relativity concept. And, of course, I'm sure, like most people, they will also have had pay rises and or promotions since they first got that mortgage in the first place. So it probably isn't quite as bad as it sounds. The Bank of England did some good work last year, which showed that the average person with a mortgage – was mm -hmm. going to pay about an extra £200 a month, which mm -hmm. is no one wants to find that money. But that was less than what we were going to be told we were going to be finding for gas and electric bills in mm -hmm. the winter of 2022. Mm -hmm. So it, it wasn't a terrible disaster. And they were getting about the, the, the Bank of England analysis said they were getting about half of that from their savings or borrowing it from somewhere, you know, making up their consumption. And half of it they were getting by cutting their consumption which probably feeds into why at the back end of 2023, mm -hmm. we had a small recession because yeah. the easiest way to get into recession is for consumers to cut consumption because we have a very consumption driven economy. I'm going to give you credit for this because I remember coming out of the gates fairly it, either in COVID or fairly shortly afterwards. I think you were one of the first, well, one of a handful of analysts who came out and said, 
stagflation. You know, we are going to, you know, we're potentially looking at limited growth um, and all the rest of it. Um, I, it's, it's a challenge, isn't it? Because it, that sounds like such a frightening word. You know, like, and at the moment, we've got, just, you know, got press articles saying, you know, the UK economy is in recession. But, you know, what does that really mean? It means we've had two quarters of negative GDP growth. PD growth. It, doesn't, it doesn't mean the world's coming to an end, does it? It's a, a thing, and I obviously accept all credit that's thrown my way, Paul. I'm not in, <laughs> not in my nature to turn it down. But you're you're right. I did I did say that very early as the most likely outcome. Um, and of course, we're not we're not through this cycle yet. So this isn't a necessarily a permanent state. I actually think we did very well to not have a bigger recession, just because you must remember with GDP, it's mm -hmm. adjusted by inflation, and if mm -hmm. inflation is eleven percent and we manage not to have a recession, it means nominally we've grown by 11%. Well, that's a phenomenal achievement, actually, but it doesn't get framed that way. They do it a different way in the US, interestingly enough, where they have a committee of economists, which is most people's idea of a nightmare, or at least quite a boring lunch at the best of, uh, at the best of times, but they decide whether it was a real recession or not. So in the US in 2022, exactly the same thing happened. They had two consecutive quarters of negative growth it was a very small uh amount exactly the same as the uk and the committee i think they called the nebr um they decided it wasn't a recession because it was just technical and it didn't matter and the, again what people don't say in the press that we followed exactly the same pattern and something i have been referring to for the last few years is when you have an event like the pandemic the us just said shut down, take your medicine, lay off 20 million people in one month or whatever. Yes, there were stimulus checks that Donald Trump was very happy to sign that you'll remember, but there isn't that workers' rights protection that there is in the UK. We had furlough, we stretched it out, the bottom wasn't as savage, but the way up took longer, which is, which is very natural. The US was much more V-shaped in its recovery which put them somewhere between six and 12 months ahead of us in this economic cycle. And I've continually referred to this. And sure enough, 12 months after the US had their technical recession that was deemed not to be a recession in the way that they measure it, we had our technical recession, which we're pretty sure we're already out of. So you do get a lot. Sometimes people ask me, or sometimes I think people think I concentrate a bit too much on the US um, and the EU might be more relevant, perhaps. I don't really think that's the case. I'm not someone who believes that the Bank of England really care what the Federal Reserve does. But when you have globalisation and you have intertwined economies, you're following the same economic... Our interest rate forward pattern and the US's mm -hmm. looks almost identical at the moment, even if our underlying challenges mm -hmm. are very different, because the US were not really impacted by the war in Ukraine, although they were because they've spent an awful lot of money trying to fund Ukraine. But that was much more of an impact. What actually they saw was a business opportunity to yeah. sell us LNG and things like that, which they which they did with skill and speed, actually, which is not necessarily um, a bad thing for either of us. Um, and unfortunately, war does create opportunity. But we've had more inflation. Our wage growth is more out of control. They've got different problems. They've got a 5.25 to 5.5 interest rate and mm -hmm. strong GDP growth. So mm -hmm. that suggests even stronger rates for longer. So at the moment, as we stand today, you would expect the UK to be leading the way on the speed of the cuts mm -hmm. versus the US. Although having said that, before anybody gets excited, the cuts in the UK are still not coming for maybe, maybe till the second half of 2023, mm -hmm. uh, 2024, sorry. Mm -hmm. And they also could be quite a lot slower than people are hoping for if this plan of the soft landing, as it's being known, mm -hmm. is actually pulled off, which unfortunately there's no guarantee of. But where we are is is pretty typical. We were, if you if you hark back to Ukraine, um, we were in a fragile position after the pandemic, and then an event happened. And again, this was something I wrote about during the pandemic. If you went back to 2016 and looked at the last really surprising event, which is when the referendum result went the other way, mm -hmm. there were a number of things that happened in the economy that would have been significantly problematic if inflation wasn't down under target and we had other challenges. We were in the middle of a recession or on the way to a recession. We weren't. The economy was bumping along okay, growing at 1.5% to 2% a year, 
And so we largely absorbed what was a significant shock to the markets after the referendum. Um, if that happened today, it would be many, many, many times more problematic. So the notion of fragility, something that um, Nassim Nicholas Taleb talks about in his anti-fragility, but which he's not for everybody. It can be a bit heavy. He's also quite a difficult character, but I think that's probably what makes him pretty good at what he does. Yeah. But the concept of uh, fragility and anti-fragility is an important one if people are interested in that sort of stuff. I am, because I'm a nerd. <laughs> Very good. Uh, to circle back to a couple of the, the points you make, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, in my previous life, I did do um, legal work for many of the big banks. And what you're conscious of is that they are, actually businesses you know and, and their business is is selling debt basically and i you know they must have had quite a difficult year in 2023 if we kind of just complete on 2023 they must have had a difficult year you know because at the breakfast meeting that i host you know people are there really sharpening their pencils and they're looking at two years two years they're looking at five year fixes and then they're you know on the verge of tears when they're looking at the the fee the product fee and everybody is sat around doing these mental or very much, you know, on paper calculations of, well, what is actually, if I put this 3% product fee on this loan, you know, and I, if I dump, as I think I go for a two year fixed with the, because I'm hyper optimistic that, you know, we're going to see rates fall like a stone, which is not the sentiment that you've echoed. It's not the sentiment that I've echoed. I think higher rates for longer is the future. I think inflation for longer is the future, you know, even like I don't say this to be provo pro 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 provocative, but are we looking at a decade's worth of high inflation because of just the way the world is? We've got war. War is inflationary. We've got all of these challenges. But circling back to the issue, we've got, you know, it's a real challenge for people sitting there with their spreadsheets, looking at the two year fixes, looking at the five year fixes, looking even at 10 year fixes and saying, where do we go when we put this product fee in? So I think there's a two parts to that question is one, how are the lenders um, able to be making a profit in these circumstances? Because surely the amount of lending they're getting out of the door must must have been reduced by these fees. Uh, and and secondly, like what's what's without obviously giving any advice, you know, what is a smart approach? to this really difficult and quite stressful challenge for people in the industry. So, you know, fabulous subject matter. And there's so many ways I could go with answering that. I think start with where you started. How tough was it for the banks last year? Yeah, we've got to remember their deposit takers as well. So we all know what happened when the rates were going up. We got a letter on the morning of the Bank of England meeting saying that your rates going up today, pal. Mm -hmm. um, if we had money on deposit in savings accounts on floating rates, they weren't so fast to put those rates up and they kind of stopped at about the two or three percent mark. So what they call their net interest margin was up by something like 60 billion, I think, across the sector in the big banks last year. So that's a lot of extra revenue. Now, you're dead right in that price goes up and, and demand goes down. Um, we've also what people might not appreciate is. When you have an inverted yield curve, so if we just define that for maybe 30 seconds, mm -hmm. the yield curve is going to plot the yield of all the government bonds by duration. So it would start at three months and it would carry on all the way out to 50 years. Mm -hmm. But if we focus on the, the three month to five year part of the curve, that was sloping downwards and it still is. It's mm -hmm. spent more than 12 months sloping downwards. That's what we call inverted because it's not what we normally expect. The, the normal performance of the bond market is the longer you lock it away for, the more interest you'd expect to get every year because you're losing, you're trading off flexibility versus um, liquidity, aren't you, effectively? And therefore, you want some extra return for losing that flexibility or, or liquidity. Mm -hmm. So this is a non-standard performance. So people would be saying, well, there was a point last year where you were seeing 6% available for a one-year account or a, an instant saver, but you wouldn't have seen that available for a five-year because the, the difference in the pricing at one point last year was at least 1% per mm -hmm. year. That's significant. So what that meant was, because it, the two-year was a higher return than the five-year, the two-year money was more expensive. So what people don't necessarily understand 
is if you're trying to make a five year comparison, you've got to put that two year if you're taking a two year product and then forecast what the three year money would be. And remember, when you're taking mortgages, you've got to include the legal fees, any searches you might need to do, the mortgage broker fees and everything else. So no wonder it's stressful for people because it's quite I, I'm a big advocate of understanding the total cost of the debt. But we don't across the board go for the cheapest total cost of debt. And this is my best way to sidestep the advice part and just tell you what we do. Right. This okay. is just, just reportage, not advice. Yeah. We will look at the total cost of the debt, but we'll also look at the cash flow because we know. And from day one, I've always known the cornerstone of our business needs to be healthy cash flow mm -hmm. because it's cash flow that finishes off 90 percent plus of businesses. Mm -hmm. So the other thing people have to consider is. Are they going to be selling that property? You can be quite sure what you're going to do over the next two years. The next five years is tougher. The next 10 years is even tougher again. And, you know, what the whole thing did for us, I think, as a, as a nation, is show us the fragility of the two-year mortgage market. And really, like, I agree with you. The I did some analysis when we were during the pandemic, which looked back at pandemics over the last 500 years, because obviously we haven't got, that many to proper ones to compare, but we still have GDP figures and interest rates and things like that available for some of that time period. And actually the shockwaves last about it from an inflation perspective up to 40 years, but you're certainly looking at a decade where inflation should probably be 1% above what it would otherwise be. And if the government ever told the truth in these situations, they would have moved the inflation target to 3%. But I can only assume the problem is the Bank of England, much as I have a relative amount of disdain, to be honest, for the governor at the moment, the rest of the organisation and the way it's set up is, is fabulous, to be honest. So they know what they're doing. They just don't care that much about the property market because they've got these other things to think about. They do care about it and they do talk about it. But we we obviously care. We've got a lot more skin in the game, so we care a lot more. Um, but they would look at they, they, they were very convinced that the interest rate wasn't going to go up to the sort of six-ish plus percent marks. They didn't say why. Um, I read in, it, I read things into things people don't say rather than just what they do say. And I was suspicious that maybe at 6%, we start to cause real problems. If we go back to the US, the, the concern from the analysts or the, the thought from the analysts is the Federal Reserve has got to cut rates because they've got so much debt and they're in a worse debt position than we are at the moment by, by some. And they're actually in the worst debt position they've ever been in. Mm -hmm. Whereas the UK, OK, 100 ish percent of GDP is not great, but we were 250 after WW2. Mm -hmm. And we had two and a half pretty fantastic decades of growth that inflated it away. So if the government was honest, I think they would set the target to 3 percent for inflation. I don't know whether that would calm markets down or not, to be honest, but I think it would have been realistic. And I'm a, this is where my tin four hat comes on in this part, Paul, because I believe the government would love three to four percent inflation for some time. And that's mm -hmm. the government of any color because mm -hmm. it inflates the debt away. But the problem is that fragility that I referred to. So perhaps these conversations go on at a governmental level and none of us are privy to them. I hope they do, because I think they're the right conversations to have. Mm -hmm. But I still feel at three percent, you'd actually be quite happy at the moment because you need to inflate that debt away. But when you're talking about the time horizons, you, you're dead right with your decade or or I'd even say maybe maybe decade plus. So I then think shrinking right back to our own micro businesses level, you've also got to think about when you're applying for mortgages, going through the process of providing your inside leg measurements and everything else you need these days, all the administration chasing the solicitors and all the rest of it, you know, we're, we're quite good in our operation. We've got a good process. It, it works, mm -hmm. although it was damaged last year because things were taking so long. Mm -hmm. So do you want to be spending your time worrying about financing or do you want to be spending your time trying to do deals and make new money? I know I know where I want the people in my operation and me to be spending our time. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've, I've really just gone five-year mortgages across the board unless I think we're going to dispose of something. Yeah. The reason why I haven't gone seven and ten as a rule is because unfortunately the seven and 10 year and, and don't, don't get me wrong it's not like we've done none i would do it on a quirky property that let's say today we've got a quirky property and there's a loan at a reasonable price 
Yeah. And I think, well, do you know what? We'll do that for seven because we're going to keep that building. Mm-hmm. And, um, and the, the lending landscape changes, not just around rates and things like that, but around lenders' appetite to lend on various things. This particular lender is new to the market. My experience mm-hmm. of lenders who are new to the market is they'll lend on what everybody else doesn't really want to lend on. Mm-hmm. So we're taking advantage of the fact there is a product today for that building for seven years. It wasn't really cheaper than the five year. It wasn't really more expensive. The problem comes in that when the the lenders go and get their money from the international markets, from the bigger banks, from the swap markets, wherever they get it from, is that the five year, there's an awful lot of liquidity on the mortgage side of things. The 10 year, there's more liquidity in the bond side, but less liquidity in the swap side. And it's the cart and the horse because the banks can provide it, but the, the, the investors aren't necessarily demanding it. And because they're not demanding it, the products aren't very competitive because, mm-hmm. the, you know, like you said, these banks are businesses. Mm-hmm. And if there's 88 lenders in the five year market and eight lenders in the 10 year market, guess what? It's a lot easier to be in the top three of the best buy table, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So they work to hi- and there is also a reason for them working to higher margins because they're in the five year market all the time because that's where the action has been. And also where a lot of the two year action has been driven even though people haven't liked the thought of fixing for five, mm-hmm. the two year, some of the two year at some points last year was over 5% with a 5% fee over two years. Now, that really worried me because I thought, are we guaranteed that level of capital growth over the next two years in order to pay that arrangement fee back? Mm-hmm. Because don't forget that's what's been going on. So there's a lot in that conversation, but I hope it gives context to what I do know from speaking to principal lenders is when they were working to save 3.5% margin in 2021, Mm -hmm. which, look, as a poker player would say, the deck hit them in the face. They were lucky because the cost of money went down and down and down. And we were still all thinking, blimey, this is a good deal at 3.25% with a 1% fee. But they were paying 0.1% for that money. Mm -hmm. So all of it was operational margin that they need to be able to run their business and profit. Mm -hmm. So where they were at, say, 33 to 3.5% margin, Today, they're about 2.7. Mm-hmm. So for the people who think that the, the fees are just greed from the banks, they're absolutely not. They're working to a lower margin, but they're doing what they need to do. The, the high fee just enables the rate to come down, mm-hmm. and that's when we get in the conversation about interest coverage ratios, debt service coverage, things like that, which, again, mm-hmm. it pertains back to my point around cash flow. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um, and an interesting comment as well that you talked you talked about trends and obviously we the first trend you identified there was ever ever raising interest rates um although not going as high as as we thought i think one one of the takeaways that i took from that as well but also from previous discussions is that it's, it's not also how high the rate goes it's how long the rate stays because you've got every month you've got more and more and more borrowers coming off their products and you know they're and you know we've all spoken to people in the in the property sector we know what this means in real terms people with you know half a million pounds worth of debt on some flats suddenly it doesn't make sense to hold on to the flats anymore um another trend you identified which i'm fascinated by is cl- the closing of estate agent offices and letting agent offices so Talk to us a little bit about that. You know, what 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 do you see in that trend? And I suppose most importantly, what are you reading into that? Uh, so I think we've got to be a little bit careful, Paul, mm-hmm. because when we talk about closure of offices, that doesn't necessarily mean that the business is closed. Yeah. Or it might be an estate agency or letting agents decided to go online only or operate a bigger portfolio where they used to have six offices, they shrunk down to two offices. And look, those cuts are being made because we had a market, we've come out of a market where, again, if you ran an estate agent, you were in the right place at the right time in the middle of 2020, cutting stamp duty, intergenerational reason for people to want to move house, absolutely manic. You'd like some more stock and the hard game was getting more stock, but if you got it, you sold it. It's as simple as that. And that lasted for about two years. So there will have been expansion in that side of things. And there will have been some inefficient businesses that were carried by that market, to be honest. 
And that's not been uncommon since interest rates have been really low. We've I've talked over the years about zombie businesses is the term that people tend to use um, who have been protected by very low interest rates. Uh, people who don't run their businesses particularly efficiently and they haven't had to because they've survived on dirt cheap debt and they start to get extinguished or they do have to finally grow, consolidate and all the rest of it. But there will be some genuine closures in that 5,000 plus offices that were closed. There's no two ways about it. I mean, if you think about it from a, if you set up a, if you start it, you know, you know what business is like, businesses start small and they grow and grow and grow. And as they grow, they pick up inefficiencies and they have going back to the banks. They might, some of them have got IT systems that are 20 and 30 years old because to change them over, it's not even just the cost implication of changing them over. It's the service level disruption when you need a hundred percent uptime because you're a bank. Mm -hmm. So it's very, a lot of this stuff as I'm, I'm sure you'll know um and the same goes for estate agents you might have started with one office and grown to six or 12 or 20 regional broad offices whereas if you set that business up today you probably say well hang on a second let's have an office in an industrial park somewhere where it's quite cheap to rent and everybody can park easily mm -hmm. and that will be our central hub for property management and maybe we're managing four or five thousand units let's say and then we need some front end presence and the best businesses I know in the locale to me, they have portfolios of thousands of units that they manage, but they have two front end offices mm -hmm. um, and they do an awful lot of business. They're selling over a hundred houses a month mm -hmm. in a market that's not particularly cheap. You know, average house, average sale of theirs might be 400, 500,000 quid. Mm -hmm. Right. But they're managing that from, from an operational cost perspective. They've still got lots of people, mm -hmm. but it's about as low as it could be. Now, it's times like 2023 where people find they need to consolidate very quickly. And of course, when you lose, you know, I think we did 400,000 fewer transactions in 23 than we did in 21. So that's a big difference because we did from about 1.4 down to about a million. Although I don't think the final figures are in yet. Um, but what's that's a, a 28, 29% drop, isn't it? So inevitably the, 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 the wind that carried them in 21 and 22 definitely stopped with Liz Truss. There's just no two ways about it. That's the marker in, in time that pricked the bubble. And when a housing bubble, and it, was, it wasn't it was burst, but it started to deflate relatively quickly. And it was cushioned by that inflationary effect that we've talked about. If there was no inflation, I think the market would have gone down 10%, but there was 10% inflation, so it hardly went down at all. That's the, the thing that most of the analysts have missed over the last 12, 18 months, I think. Um, although it's not really that difficult a concept to put your head around. But I was, I was very, very high on inflation forecasts early on and consistently. And I still am at the top end of people's range. And I ask myself every day, have I got stuck in a rut? Am I a broken record? Do I need to start changing my mind? But then I look at with minimum wage going up 9.8% this year and pensions going up 85 And think, this is not inflation under control, folks. So whoever says that it is, Mm -hmm. All they're trying to do is manage business and consumer expectations. That's mm -hmm. the reality of it. Because if the Bank of England um, Monetary Policy Committee members were allowed to speak freely, mm -hmm. things would look very different, in my opinion. But mm -hmm. I believe we're taking this gamble that I was talking about by keeping inflation at about 4%, because we need it from the debt perspective. Mm -hmm. Right? It's a pain for all of us with the frozen tax thresholds. Mm -hmm. And I could have a full podcast soapbox on that if you want to, Paul, at any time. Um, <laughs> But it's the old, well, look, 2020, there was free money. Now we're all paying for it. We all knew that we were time mm -hmm. if we asked ourselves in reality. I don't think any of us can really complain, to mm -hmm. be honest. Um, we can complain about the fraud. We can complain about the people who ripped the system off. And we, we should. And mm -hmm. we should hold those people to account, which one way or another, even if it has to be people like Dan Needle doing it rather than people like the UK government doing it, he's mm -hmm. certainly having a go at doing some bits on that front um, in terms of... Uh, baroness moan and, and all the rest of it but yeah, yeah, yeah. rather than that uh, we, we've had our legal disclaimer so i'll move i'll move off that subject now paul but that's the that's the, the the lie of the land as i see it around you know where we're going um and interest rates and, and inflation as reality i think fantastic i mean and, and i'm keen for us to now sort of transition into um looking at the road ahead um actually before we do i saw a very very interesting um interview with Rishi Sunak where he was shut down by the BBC reporter when he was talking about inflation you're saying our key target is to reduce inflation before we reduce taxes 
it operates as a tax upon effectively as a tax from the people at which point i thought that is a remarkable moment of honesty from a politician at which point the bbc interviewer shut him down said it's not a tax it's like how are we ever going to make any progress um because we all know that inflation operates a, a tax and interestingly it operates as a penalty to the poorest in society because it's a bigger part of their disposable income but then you'll leave that to, to one side but i'm really i underlined it in red adam i've never your words previously i've never been so bullish on property prices so let's transition into like gazing into the crystal ball if you don't mind into 2024 um as i say i underlined that comment and, and raised an eyebrow i'm not gonna i'm not gonna lie to you never been more bullish on property prices now i'm bullish on property prices for the next decade but i think there's some work to do before we get there but interestingly you're bullish so explain more adam yeah, sure thing. So bear in mind, put this into context. I'm never normally bullish. I'm quite miserable. I'm an economist by training. So don't get too excited. I haven't got the fireworks out and selling the family silver to get involved. But I, I, I can honestly stand by that comment. I have never been so bullish. Now, I'm not talking about the next three months or six months necessarily, Paul, because we know that things move slowly. How would this year maybe play out? The market gets started. I think it probably has, and we'll see the evidence of that feeding through. There's a bit of a wobble as people realise that interest rates aren't going to come down as quickly as maybe they thought they were, but it goes relatively healthily until everyone remembers there's an election and that election announcement comes, and then there's another wobble because the retail buyers always get spooked around an election time. And then actually, I think whoever gets elected after that, that's the point at which things will will maybe take off a bit. Now, there are dangers because although tunnel vision and, and press commentary and by-elections at the moment only tell us that Labour are going to hand out an absolute beating, mm -hmm. not all roads lead to Rome there because A, Starmer's not particularly charismatic, let's face it. He's not Tony Blair at the end of the day. Um, and there are things that are upsetting Labour Party support in general as well. There's no two ways about it. Mm -hmm. um b the turnout is a factor uh without a shadow of a doubt and there's a risk of a low turnout but things do look grim for the conservatives because you've got reform on their far right who are going to pinch some votes there's no two ways about it they're going to be an expensive pain in the backside it's going to cost them a lot of money and they're not going to achieve anything in my opinion but their farage might finally get elected i suppose once he's uh nailed his colors to whichever mask they're going to be they're going to be nailed to um but I, I agree. I think Sunak, I, I, I like moments of honesty from politicians. I think they're a good thing. It's why I could never be a politician, because I'd want to do them every day. And people would be telling me I was oversharing reality with the general public or whatever. But I think what Sunak could also have said is, ultimately, cutting taxes is inflationary. Because as soon as you put more money in people's pockets, especially those who are paid less and have lower disposable incomes, they spend 100% of it. And that in itself feeds inflation. So there could be an argument if we thought we were in a genuine recession for cutting tax in order to put more money in people's pockets to boost consumption, to lift us out of the recession. As, I, as we've said, I don't think we are in that genuine recession. I think it's been the technical recession for the moment and we're safe until something else bad happens, really. Um, so there's no two ways about it. That's why one of the reasons I was so critical of Liz Truss was not so much the, well, apart from the fact they didn't know what they were doing and they didn't work within the framework they were given, was mm -hmm. the idea of cutting tax at a time when inflation is 11% mm -hmm. is a total and utter nonsense. And anybody who thinks opposite to that, I'm afraid, it might be conservative values or whatever, wrong time for that policy, even if you think it was the right policy. Mm -hmm. And in reality, I'm, I'm stunned, actually, how much hell, if you look at income tax, it was said the other day, the income tax burden is actually lower than it was in 2010. Now, that's not the only fruit, because you've got to consider VAT, which as you have already correctly said, when tax goes up, VAT hits the poorest in society so much more, because it's on chuffing everything that they buy apart from anything else. And the Conservatives in this fairly long administration or the coalition anyway, put VAT up from 17.5 to 20% 
back in 2011. And you know what VAT is like? It never goes back down. In fact, they talked about putting it up to 22 and a half, if you remember, which I think only France of the major developed nations that I know has a VAT. I think they charge 25% sales tax. But yeah, right. pretty, pretty onerous for a supposedly socialistic economy but there you go um so i think that that's absolutely right about tax cut tax it's inflationary raise tax it's disinflationary so when taxes did go up now i appreciate as a politician you probably can't say that as brutally because i'm taking money out of your pockets adam and paul in order that you haven't got it to spend it doesn't sound like a great proposition for the general public but it is fiscally responsible without a shadow of a doubt um, unfortunately, fiscally responsible extends so far. Most people want fiscal responsibility as long as it's not about the NHS or pensions, realistically. Yeah. Um, and that's the, that's your problem with being a politician. And so um, it's, it's interesting what you say about, you know, potential, because it would lo- it looks from this this perspective that, um, and I'm, you know, I, I'm not espousing a particular view, but it looks like the Labour Party should romp home at the election. But when you look at, if you think about all the major headline polls that we have been fed over the last decade, they have nearly all turned out to be wrong, uh, whether it's in relation to Brexit, whether it's in relation to, you know, the Red Wall is coming. Donald um, Trump. Donald yeah. Trump. Like yeah. all of these polls have been fundamentally um, wrong, which makes, you know, as I suppose as a bit of a, a cynic in that context, makes me question the validity of any of them. But um, I'm not going to ask you to make a political p- uh, prediction. I'm not going to do that. But you think, am I right in hearing that once we get through the other side of the election, that possibly we're off back to the races because retail investors will have got their confidence back just because they have certainty rather than anything anything else? You frame that perfectly, Paul. I couldn't add a lot to that. That's exactly how I feel. And I, the only thing I would add in about my extreme bullishness yeah. is to reiterate my inflation convictions of that 1% higher over the next decade, averaging out somewhere along the line because of the pandemic and the stimulus, apart from anything else, and the increase in the money supply. Mm-hmm. And yes, yes, the certainty will help. But also, if you look at the long-term trend line, Mm-hmm. We are 25% below that long-term trend line after inflation, after inflation adjustments have been made. Whereas if you went back to 2007, we were 35% above the long-term trend line in real terms of housing prices. So you've got to just put the the, ha- the price of a house, the nominal price, and just put it away in a box somewhere. Even some really experienced and very well-respected journalists that I've spoken with said to me, well, house prices have gone up more than inflation since 2007. And I just, I'm sorry, that's absolute nonsense. And I know that it is. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. I do now because I went and looked them up. Mm-hmm. And actually, house prices have gone up 40% and inflation was 65. So mm-hmm. that they absolutely haven't gone up that much in real terms. Um, they've gone down in real terms since that peak of the market. And actually, if you adjust for RPI, the retail price index, over the last 20 years, house prices have only just kept pace with the retail price index. Well, mm-hmm. that doesn't suggest to me like a market that, you know, it spent 50 years before that going up beyond that. Of course, wages feed into it. But if you put the last building block on my wall of why I'm so bullish here, mm-hmm. minimum wage is up 9.8% this year. Mm-hmm. And although not everyone's on minimum wage, it has a cascade effect mm-hmm. throughout. I mean, the civil service struggled last year because some of their workers are so poorly paid that that minimum wage rise meant they needed a bigger wage rise than the civil service were negotiating. Mm-hmm. So the, the, what, what economically you've got to remember, once something like a minimum wage is genuinely in the market, right? When, when, when it was introduced by Labour, frankly, it was a bit of a political tool and it didn't make any difference, right? Because hardly anyone was getting paid below that minimum wage. But as it gains ground in real terms, mm-hmm. which... Come to April, up 9.8. What will inflation be in April? Let's guess 3% for mm-hmm. April, right? Because there's a few reasons why it should come down. Energy prices coming down again, blah, blah, blah. I'm just talking about April's number. Then there's a 7% rise in real terms over the course of that year mm-hmm. in minimum wage. That's massive. Mm-hmm. That's actually unprecedented, which is a word we overuse during the pandemic. But it is it is unprecedented. So... That, none of that adds up to 
inflation under control. And what do people do when they've got more money in their pockets? And I did a piece on this at the weekend, Paul. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to catch up with this weekend supplement yet, but I talked about there's, there's a number of people saying we should measure GDP per capita because that's a better measure of a recession than GDP. And that's been on the way down for two years. Right, OK. I would agree with that, apart from the fact the same people tend to slag off GDP anyway as a not very good measure of how you and I and the individuals in the economy are doing. Mm -hmm. As it happens, the ONS, being the helpful chaps and chapettes that they are, have a measure called the Real Household Disposable Income, RHDI. Real, adjusted for inflation. Household, Mm -hmm. the types of households you and I um, provide tenancies to. Disposable, Mm -hmm. aka after the tax man's had his or her slice. And income. Well, ultimately, income is what people, you know, forget wealth for the moment. Wealth effects are a totally different conversation. The two often get brought together. And it's one of the biggest mistakes that some of the economic commentators make, because some of the biggest wealth inequality in the world is in countries like Sweden that have pretty good income equality, very good equality of opportunity. But they're old economies and there's still wealth um, and there's still opportunities for people to make massive money if they get lucky put in the effort put in the time take the risks and all the other things that all your listeners will know you know so that those things when you put them all together to me spell a 25 plus percent nominal price rise over the next five years Mm -hmm. and i'm fairly confident in that and if i was betting i'd be above 25 percent nominal now i'm not guaranteeing what inflation is going to do because that's harder Right. And that could well be in that inflation could be 18 percent of that, mm-hmm. you know, um, and that's but that would still leave us below the normal, the, the long term trend line for property prices. Um, so that's really my bullish case in what's a lot bigger than a nutshell, a, a bucket, a coconut. <laughs> a coconut. Well, let's, let's add like a final a final element just to that, because it was a question that somebody asked me to ask you. And I'm going to I'm, I'm going to like paraphrase it so much that they won't recognize their own question but effectively where do demographics fit within your thesis so the the person who asked the question was making a really good point is that you know over the last 50 years demographics have changed unrecognizably so if you look at the home um everybody in the home everybody of working age who is you know in the market is now is now working so we've got more bodies being um economically productive but yet we live and also we live in different setups and different ways don't we so how does demographics feed into your view and well your clear bullish view how does the demographics fit into this piece so that again is a, a fabulous whoever's raised that question i i applaud them because that's a fantastic line of direction to take this conversation in so i think we've got to split it into two parts what we know and what we don't know so what we know with demographics is we know, I can tell you, for example, the nearest big city to me, Birmingham, they have got a, a record number of 18 to 30s who are going to become 18 to 30 over the next decade. Mm-hmm. Now, they tend to be renters, and so that would be a bullish sign for the rental market in Birmingham, right? We also know we've got the baby boomers continuing to transition through to the elderly care side of things, which is one of the reasons why I've got involved relatively recently in an uh, elderly care group mm-hmm. um, because, the de- again, the demographic, th- those are the bits that we know in the population bulge. What do we not know? The impact of net migration. And the last two years of 1.3 million net migrants are very, very significant on the rental market around the country in general because, of course, when you've just come to the UK, almost certainly you've got to rent somewhere unless you're keeping on your family or friends couch or whatever which I, I believe a whole hundreds of thousands of people who have come will will be doing that at the moment mm-hmm. um leading to over occupation situations in in many many parts of the country there's no doubt about that because the numbers just don't add up otherwise so what's the norm going forward for net migration who knows i find again i find uh, the piece of analysis that i find missing in every other analyst i hear talk about this is ultimately What's driving net migration so much, right? And again, if you go back to Sunak being honest, Mm -hmm. if he was honest, he would have said, we have 1.2 million job vacancies. We also have the best university system in the world, Mm -hmm. right? Those universities survive. And frankly, although people moan about tuition fees, 
they subsidise tuition fees for people who are living in England or Wales by having international students they charge treble the price to. So, of course, they should get more international students in in order to keep those subsidies available. Tuition fees have went, went from three grand to nine grand to 92.50. Everything else is up 25 or 30%. So by rights, they should be 12 grand by now, but they're not. Why is that? Because we keep bringing in more and more people. But then you've also got global warming, which has been more, more and more impact over the over the last couple of years. It's been quite quite visible around the world, which displaces people. And you've got to, you've got to consider that as well. And you've also got the effects of the pandemic, which displaces people. And you already correctly raised. You've also got a bit more war than you've had before. And of course, once you toss in the Hong Kong, you know, the British Nationals Overseas Scheme has mm -hmm. brought in a couple of hundred thousand people as it goes with an average net worth of about £350,000 per head. Now, my view as an economist would be, blimey, welcome them with open arms as quickly as you can, because guess what happens when they get here? They're in the UK tax system. Thanks very much. And they're net contributors, uh, not net detractors at any point. Whereas with a lot of migration, it can take a while for migrants to start being positive contributors to the system, even though if you look at it over a 40-year time span from the economic perspective, they are net contributors. And think about those demographics we were just talking about. You also have a bit of a hole in the middle of our demographics, not as bad as you do in Italy, Germany, Japan, countries like that. But we need workers of working age who are willing to work, who, again, being slightly political here, will do the jobs that other people don't want to do, Paul, at the end of the day. So this is all, I feel, and this is only feel, really heuristics nothing i've not modeled this that normal migration now for the next few years probably looks like 400 to 450 thousand people mm -hmm. right you know as well as i the labor party have set this ambitious target of one and a half million homes most people burst out laughing when they hear that although actually we're not so far off but if we keep turning the screw on building regs again and again and again it is going to be harder. The house builders dealt with 2023 with extreme skill because what they did is they restricted supply mm -hmm. and they kept up their usual old, old tricks and new house prices still inflated last year. They did what they needed to do. That helps the big house builders and their shareholders. It doesn't help the, the country as a whole, but until the government's building that housing, there you go. But we all know we're a bit short on materials and labor, mm -hmm. mostly thanks to Brexit to build those one and a half million homes. The other problem the Labour Party have got is how will they try and deliver it? And therefore, how will they fund it? Because they won't be building houses cheaper than 250 grand a unit if it's if it goes anywhere near the public sector. There's no way that they will because there'll be a million circos and the likes who are willing to do the job at extremely high prices, Mighties and Kias and all the rest of it. Um, so they need the private sector to deliver. But even if they want the private sector to deliver, how are they going to facilitate that and how are they going to fund it? Mm -hmm. And you can start to look at budgets like the housing benefit bill and say, OK, well, if we're spending this many tens of billions per year, right, how much can we invest and how much will we save by doing that? But then you've got to deliver it. But this stuff takes time, mm -hmm. you know, whereas this administration hasn't really looked at it that way. They've taken the this is one of their big problems. They've taken that ideological standpoint of we hate benefits. We hate this. We hate that. But our benefits bill is so huge. What you need to do is you need to coach, absorb and culture that part of the economy and make it work for everybody. And now we've got such a big I mean, look at the temporary accommodation figures, Paul, is what I would point to. You know, some areas of the country, they're up 67 percent in 12 months. And I'm afraid to say when Angela Rayner is in the election campaign and she's talking about getting rid of Section 21, if Mr. Gove hasn't now done what he said he's going to do again, that he said he was going to do before. Yeah. But let's face it, it all depends on when the election is called, mm -hmm. uh, apart from anything else, because Parliament will just stop. So that will that will put paid to doing leasehold reform and that will put paid to renters reform bill if they haven't already received um, royal assent. And ultimately, we'll, well, we'll see what happens, won't we? But if Angela Rayner starts saying I'm banning Section 21 on day one, there'll be 50,000 Section 21s issued before you know about it for people who are issuing them to be better safe than sorry. And the temp problem goes up and up and up and up and up on the back of all of that as well. Yeah. So 
Thank you very much for Adam. I shall convey your thanks to um, the um, person who sent in that question as well, because it's a great question and it add, added a lot to the piece as well. So obviously I'm going to signpost people towards your LinkedIn profile. I'm going to um, tell them to absolutely check out the supplement. I think the best way of doing that is go to Adam's LinkedIn profile, I'll put the link below, follow him. And then that way you'll always be up to date with all the stuff that Adam's doing. But I've got two quick questions for you, if you don't mind, to finish. The first is, you know, you're a busy man. You know, you've got a family, you've got multiple businesses, you've got multiple JV partners, you do property consultancy. You, you know, you obviously put a lot, you know, your heart and soul into the supplement as well. You, you know, like all of us, we have to make a series of complex decisions all of the time. And this is an, a challenging environment. You know, it's not, you know, it's not the number go up environment where house prices are going up in a continual fashion. So just, I suppose, from a life hack perspective, like if you could think of anywhere between one and three things that you think contribute to you managing the stress of running your businesses and all the other stuff you've got in your life, like what would they be? Like between one and three things do you think would make a meaningful difference to, to people? So I think you, you did the health disclaimer already, which is good, because the first one I'm going to say is I wasn't very good at looking after myself before the pandemic came and the favour that it did me. and some of that was putting my family first. Some of that was putting my businesses first and all the rest of it, putting my ambitions first, to be honest, Paul, probably. And the pandemic, that's where I got a bit of a shift in mindset and said, right, OK, I need to be quite selfish about the health side of things. I've started doing much more research about stuff that I'm embarrassed to say I knew very, very little about um, in terms of routines, in terms of sleep. You know, I wear this, this aura ring now that is a, a sleep tracker which is phenomenal bear in mind i'm a data geek and it gives me data so of course i love it but yeah. it's the old if you can't measure it you can't manage it sort mm -hmm. of thing and i've made so i think you have to be selfish with that and i i compartmentalize that quite well like i do with a lot of things in that i have a little routine first thing in the morning i am an early riser i'm a a lark or a lion or whatever you want to call it so I, i'm lucky like that but I do think you can change your chronotype if you want to. And I spend that first hour of the day pretty much on myself. So light exercise, usually go out and walk the dog, to be honest, mm -hmm. um, but gets gets the steps up, keeps me moving, all the rest of it. And then I also make a big effort to get at least half an hour a day out in the, I can't say the sunshine because it's England, right? But, yep. but, I, but out in the light, out in the yep. natural light, usually when I'm making a phone call. So, that probably feed into my second one, which would be double and triple timing. I'm often doing two or three or four things at once, mm -hmm. all of which have mutual benefit. So, again, using the family example, I might walk with the dog at the weekend, take one of my children so they've got one-to-one -one time, and also mm -hmm. they're getting the benefit of the outside world, which might rip them off an iPad for 10 minutes or whatever, as I know any, any parents listening to this <laughs> will know that challenge as well. Um, so th there'll be those two things. And also, number three is really about, you know, having a resilient mindset mm -hmm. and not worrying about what you can't control. We had the other day at a property, what I can only describe as a small avalanche, because there was a, I've learned some stuff about building this week. It was a perma crib wall, which failed. And mm -hmm. basically some boulders came out. No one was hurt. Nothing was made, but it's, it's 50 grand's worth of work that needs sorting out that should be covered by insurance. Now, myself and my business partners could be under a duvet cover, hiding and worrying what if the insurance don't pay out and this, that and the other. We're not going to worry about what we can't control, Paul. We're going to go through the process. We're going to do the things right. We're, we're almost certainly going to appoint a loss assessor on that one who's going to be on our side. Um, and it's just the, the ladder of accountability, if you've come across it, you know, I always start by blaming myself when something goes wrong and asking what I could have done better. Blame yeah. is the wrong word because it sounds a bit negative. I'm not giving myself a hard time, but I'm saying, right, in the now, how do we fix it? Great. Mm -hmm. What do we do next time to make sure it doesn't happen again? Yeah. And then we're going to look down and say, now let's get to the root cause of why it happened. Mm -hmm. And all the people that I put around me, I try and foster that continuous improvement, Kaizen kind of mindset that mm -hmm. says, okay, you know, because what will happen here is instead of because quite often people get anxious about things that have done wrong and they might take the blame and they might be internalizing that. Mm -hmm. It's not good for their mental health, you know. Yeah. So it's important to say to them, not your fault, but let's make sure this doesn't happen again. How are we going to do that? Mm -hmm. And and also next time you're going to feel like you're doing a better job and this should make your job easier. 
Mm -hmm. which is a positive so it's it is finding a way to be i would describe myself as annoyingly positive paul really because people who are a bit less glass half full than i am i've always got a positive spin on a situation but that's very deliberate because it enables me to have a very large capacity for quite stressful work um i love that annoyingly positive (laughs) and you have um, beautifully either stolen my last question or segued into um, even the benefit of saying you've segued into it although I do feel like you have stolen the question which is the final question of the day and I suppose it is prompted from having spent a day in the boardroom with you you know you know you 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 know annoyingly optimistic I'm not sure I'd use the uh, uh, annoyingly positive I'm just gonna say positive but we are I'm trying to build this case for optimism in 2024 because i think we are being bombarded by um negativity from so many directions including people who should frankly know better you know because everybody's looking for clicks and follows and all the rest of it but my 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 observation on that is twofold is one nihilism is is the absolute opposite of what people need so if we bombard people with negative messages and they give up hope and they think that the world really is coming to an end it it has a very direct impact on their behavior so you know they don't do all the good things they need to do so we need to avoid people slipping into nihilism and also i think my experience of people who create beautiful elegant wonderful lives with you know rich and fulfilling lives is that it, they, they tend to kind of be positive people to start out with. So it's that chicken and egg thing. It's like, you know, does positivity, does happiness lead to results? I My base case is yes. So, Adam, if you're with me on this, make the base case for why being, to use your words, uh, an annoyingly positive, or in my words, you know, a perpetual optimist or a rational optimist, however you want to position it, make that case for us, Adam. Why Why should we be positive? Well, first of all, I fundamentally agree with that. And is it the old Henry Ford quote where he says, if you believe you can or believe you can't, you'll be right. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's a danger if you believe you can fly off a building. I mean, obviously you, you can't. But but ultimately, I certainly think the other half of that, if you believe you can't, you will be right because you won't try mm-hmm. in the first place. And it makes sense. It's a bit like um, it's the old give a man a fish versus teach a man to fish side of things. The more something and someone else looks after you, then the less you'll do for yourself. It's just natural. It's not something to be despised in human nature. It's why you need to start with yourself. And it's why someone like Jordan Peterson with his 12 rules for life, say, you know, rule number one, you know, make your bed in the morning or whatever, because ultimately you've got to take responsibility for that for yourself and you've got to want to improve. And the problem is, I think, you know, I live in Solihull. There's a big uh, factory in Solihull where the workers on the track tend to have a certain mentality. There's just a culture in there of that they they visualise the big bosses off somewhere getting fat on their sweat, toil and labour. But mm-hmm. actually, in reality, they get paid reasonably well. There's overtime available for people who want to do it. They know what their job is. They don't leave work late or, or they don't have to come in early. They've got no stress when they leave the building. There are positives in that if that's what you want to do. And, and they can they can still earn a pretty healthy living out of it. I see the positives in that. It's up to people to a lot of this is about framing, Paul, isn't it? How do you frame what happens to you? I remember, I mean, one of the most incredible stories I've ever heard in property actually was from someone who had got a cancer diagnosis and framed it within themselves as an opportunity to see what they could do with their body in order to combat cancer. Now, that is at the very, very top end of what, have I got that inside me? I'd hope to think that I would, but I don't really fancy being tested on it, even though there's a 50% chance one day that I will be. Um, but that that just shows you what things can do. And I think where Western medicine and Eastern medicine differ too much, and Western medicine's probably rightly had a fairly hard time over the last few years, is that Eastern puts a lot more about the mind and the body connection and talking to each other. People don't understand necessarily the the, the link between physical and mental health. Mm-hmm. And there's such a big link between the two. If either one of those is in the toilet, the other one will absolutely definitely suffer. Mm-hmm. It's So, so I, I take a kind of an approach to my mental health like I'm training to be an Olympic athlete. I don't mm-hmm. do that with my physical health, I must say, but I do, I do my... 
I do what I find appropriate and I have the time and the passion to do for my physical health. Mm -hmm. But with my mental health, I genuinely think about it like I'm going to the gym every day and I'm training six hours a day by reading what I read and listening what I listen to and challenging myself and pushing myself. And that, again, from the from the selfish point of view, one of the things I get from writing the supplement is I get that clarity of thought and I'm accountable to the likes of yourself and your listeners. And now that I'm happy to say thousands of people who read it or listen to it on a weekly basis, because if I don't turn up one Sunday, there's a problem, especially mm-hmm. as I've got around saying things like, unless there's a nuclear bomb in Solihull, Hill, the supplement's going to be at 6.30 on a Sunday morning. So it, it, it's, it's putting that relevant. I think some people in property struggle with this and I'm creative by my personality type. Mm-hmm. It's using positive structures around you and again, it's that word you introduced this point with, positivity, using positive structures to get the best out of you. Mm-hmm. Because in the old sort of, uh, you know, leave your job, sack your boss, blah, blah, blah. That's all fine, right? But not if your mentality is so that I don't have to work very hard. Yeah. Or so, because again, some of those structures are positive. You need meaning in your life. Mm-hmm. You need goals to achieve even if they're quite soft goals, you need you need to be able to achieve them. And then you get into the the the, the further downstream elements of that, which I know you you talk about as well. And uh, I think probably why you and I get on so well, because we have a very similar, um, a very similar take on that sort of thing. And it makes so much difference to people's lives. I don't see a I would struggle to make the case for the other side, Paul. Look at it that way. Perfect. And I am not going to add to that. I'm going to leave that exactly where it is. And to say heartfelt thank you, Adam. I really appreciate I know you're a busy man. Um, I'm great that we've managed to get it done today. Uh, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. It's been a pleasure as always. Well, thank you for having me again, Paul. Much appreciated. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. So I will put in the uh, um, the notes below, I'm going to put the link to Adam's um, LinkedIn profile. Do follow him, then do subscribe to the supplement. I suppose in theory, if you didn't enjoy it, you can unsubscribe. Why you'd want to do that? I have no idea. But subscribe to the supplement. Enjoy it. Um, if you'd like to discuss anything in this podcast or indeed any of the podcasts, please join me at the next uh, Property and Investor Breakfast. Some of them are in person. Some of them are Zoom. You can pick how you pick, how you attend. The link is below. Please do me a favor before you go, which is please do subscribe to the podcast. It makes an enormous difference to the podcast on all the platforms. So please do click that subscribe button. It will be very, very much appreciated. And thank you to everybody who's already done that. Keep well. Speak soon. Thanks very much for joining us on the podcast. It's a pleasure as always.